I think in my earlier days, I was spoiled in a lot of ways that I had no real idea just how powerful those days were or how important they would become in my latter years. But had I not been given such a strong foundation, such a sure, solid work of God working in my life, then I would not have been able to draw upon my experiences in life to be able to minister to the entire body of Christ and to love the brethren as we are commanded and called to do. Because in my younger days, I was so intimidated by people in general. I was uh, very, I guess you'd say, A-type personality on the surface. But inside, there was such a, a shy, withdrawn person that was tender, but also scared, you know, and to hide that, I guess, you know, I, I covered it up with this veneer of... Uh, logic and intelligence and knowledge that was out here but the man inside always reached out with feelings and always extended himself out there and got hurt <laughs> regularly and then when I got saved it was it was interesting because I had such a wonderful emotional experience and you know supernatural knowledge but I had no real connection with the body of believers, you know, because I had things that made me different. You know, I was going through a a very tragic time of of dealing with a a incurable disease, and at that time people were like, "Well, we'll heal you," you know. And no, I didn't get healed, <laughs> or you know, oh, there must be sin in your life. I mean, you know, a lot of weird things floating around in those days. And I didn't want to get caught up in what they were doing, but I had such a tight relationship with God that I wanted to hang on to that, you know. So in my early days, I I went to Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, you know, I, I had moved in my car, and I wanted to be close to, you know, the teaching that I heard on the radio, and, and uh, huh, I remember, oh, just loving the studies, but never talking to anyone. I would go into a Bible study, and no one would talk to me. They wouldn't come up and say, hi, how are you, or share with me, or even care, it seemed like. And, uh, but I was always so blessed, you know, just, I mean, I was, I know I was glowing. It was just like, the word was so cool. And so I just, I just soaked it in. I was just loving it. And then one day, one, one guy came up to me and asked me if I wanted to go with him to pass out tracts. And I said, sure, you know, so. I got to know him, and he disappeared eventually. Who knows, he may have been an angel, but he kind of broke the ice for me. I gradually got to know a few people and opened up a little bit. But in my early days, I, I uh, went to volunteer at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa's tape lending library at a time when it was crucial to get these tapes, you know, recorded and passed out to people. And we had people from all over the world and all over the churches, bodies, and people from everywhere coming into the tape lending library to get Chuck's latest tape. You know, I think it was chaos and crazy and fun and exciting, but people were always coming from so many different backgrounds, and they always had so many questions. We didn't answer them. We just give them a tape and pray for them and let them go, you know. Didn't even pray for them. Sometimes just prayed after they left. But it was such a wondrous time that I used to see Catholics and Protestants and Methodists and atheists and hippies and religious people and non-religious people and just everybody from everywhere of all walks of life come into the tape lending library to get free tapes, you know, that they would study and they take ten at a time, you know, and they they bring them back, you know, I mean. They bring them back, and we'd scrape the labels off, and we'd record them over them, you know, and send them back out again. You know, I mean, it was just chaos, <laughs> craziness. And, uh, but the wondrous part of it all was that the joy of being able to see the entire body of Christ as one, to be able to accept each other as learning and growing in the knowledge of Jesus, to be able to 
not half pushed away anyone, but you accepted everyone to come and study. And whatever God's telling you to do, you go do. You know, and enjoy it. Well, cool. Take the tapes. You know, if you don't want to come here, great. Just take the tapes and go. You know, and it was such a blessing and such a fun time. In my later years, you know, I'm glad to look back on that, to know that there is a body of believers that we all are. That as much as people try to segregate and segment and section off each other from each other, that there are still ways that God unifies the body of believers. Like right now on Facebook ministry that I'm doing, so many people from so many different venues and walks of life, even different countries, are participating in those presentations and posts and studies and ministries that you know, I put out on the internet for them, that I'm blessed you know, to see how God can bring together all of us as one when he wants to. So I do get frustrated at times when people are picking on somebody or attacking somebody, you know, whether it be a, a MacArthur claiming Billy Graham's not saved or whether it be some other stupid idea that somebody is blown out of proportion either about, say, a Rick Warren or a Greg Laurie or, or even attacking Chuck Smith. I mean, man, you know, people just, whenever they're bored and they don't have much to do, I guess, they just attack the big names and they don't go after the little names. I mean, pick me. Hey, I, I'll put a bullseye on here so you can attack me. I'll, I'll talk back. <laughs> I'll defend myself. No, I won't. Because, you see, the Lord has all of us uniquely designed for a specific purpose in mind. And whether you understand it or not, and whether you really have a grasp on it, if you're not meant to minister to the body of Christ, sometimes you can't see the big picture. Sometimes you think that some little ink, you know, that got into your eye, you know, uh, affects the entire understanding you have of somebody and their ministry. But God never really created us to be judging each other. I mean, Jesus was the first one who came along and said, hey, you know what? Maybe before it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and you were going to wipe each other out, you know, in order to get justice. Well, I'm telling you, no, it's not an eye for an eye and it's tooth for a tooth. Forgive. Forget. Move forward. You know, judge not. You know, because, hey, if you're going to judge, I'm going to judge you the same way you got judged. You know, and the same way you took care of your brethren, I'm going to take care of you. <laughs> so if we have a master that we're serving, then shouldn't it be doing what he says to do and not what we think we should do? See, that's where I think the, the crux of it lies, is that sometimes people get maybe carried away about what they read and what they hear as opposed to what they ask God to do about it. Because, you know, I've heard all the studies, you know, I mean, I could, I could go off on tangents real easy. <laughs> you know, I could jump on some bandwagon somewhere and, you know, toot my own horn and, you know, crack my own whip and stomp my own feet and get on my own soapbox and go after somebody, you know, and create such havoc and mayhem that, You'd wonder if I was a Christian or I was just kind of being used by Satan in order to accomplish his purpose. You know, sometimes I think that's what people do. You know, they get carried away with themselves. They're not carried away with God much. But if you do get into allowing God's Holy Spirit, which is peaceable, which is gentle, which is meek, to work in your life, then, you know, you don't get caught up in these weird movements where they're barking and prophesying and claiming and naming and you know defaming people because it seems like that's where they kind of get carried away in. you know it's like they get kind of a little bit of idea that they've got some power or something and then they kind of lose it and abuse it and then what comes in i have no idea because Though I was overwhelmed in emotion by the Holy Spirit, I was never, like, I don't know, maybe it's a different gift I have, but when I examine the fruit of what people are doing sometimes in 
telling me these prophecies they have or telling me these things they're doing. I kind of look at it and go, I don't think so, you know. But, you know, if that's what God's telling you to do, then you should do it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But just don't involve me in it. And, you know, I think that's a safe place to be. Is that if you're talking to God and God's telling you what to do, you don't need to worry about the other guy. Let them go do what they want to do, you know. If, you know, they want to, I don't know, throw gold dust in the air and pretend like it's a miracle. Okay. We know. <laughs> yeah. Woo, look at that. It's sparklies. <laughs> or if they want to condemn everyone because it's Christmas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's kind of like a good time of the season to maybe talk about God since people are already talking about God. <laughs> I mean, okay, if you don't want to talk about God, fine, you go somewhere else and don't talk about God. <laughs> oh boy. Or if you're really looking for pagan, you know, I mean, why don't you just go to a witchcraft seminar? I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to look very far to find pagan, you know. For some reason, people just seem to get off on tangents and don't stick to what they're told to do. Which I think is like share the gospel, you know. Maybe they forget that. Maybe they think they're supposed to be the Holy Spirit. Maybe they think they're supposed to clean up everybody else's act. But you know, Jesus had something else to say. In my utmost, what is that to you? Lord, what shall this man do? What is that to you? Follow thou me. John 21. 21 and 22. One of our hardest lessons comes from the stubborn refusal to see what we to see that we must not interfere in other people's lives. It takes a long time to realize the danger of being an amateur providence of God, that is, interfering with God's order for others. You see a certain person suffering and you say, Oh no, he shall not suffer, and I'll see that he doesn't. You put your hand, you know, right in front of God's permissive will to prevent it. And God says, what is that to you? Why are you doing what I have not told you to? But, but Lord, he, he was suffering. Yes, but, but, but Lord, I was supposed to take care of the suffering and the needy. Why? Did I tell you to? But you wrote it, really. Did you ask me? No. Did you seek me? No. Did you find my will for him? No. I just read it. Okay. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. And knock and the door will be open to you. But if you don't ask, don't do it. If you don't seek, don't try it, and if you don't knock, don't open doors that weren't there. Okay, Lord. If there is a stagnation spiritually, never allow it to go on, but get into God's presence and talk to God about it. Get into God's presence and find out why you're stagnant. Get into God's presence and find out why you're not hearing Him tell you what to do. Possibly you will find it is because you have been interfering in the life of another. Proposing things you had no right to propose and teaching them things you had no right to teach them. Advising when you had no right to advise. Providing when you had no reason to provide. Doing those things you think was right in your own eyes, but not doing those things that I said you should do. Rather, seek me first and my righteousness. Seek first my kingdom. Seek first to hear from me, and then all of these things will be given unto you in wisdom, in knowledge, in direction, in leading, in guiding, in providing. When you do have to give advice to another, God will advise through you with the direct understanding of His Spirit. Your part is to be rightly related to God that his discernment comes through you all the time for blessings of another, 
not so you can beat someone else up. It's easy to discern what is wrong, but rather it is the Holy Spirit that gives you the words to encourage someone to do what is right. So it's not enough to simply beat someone down. Rather, it is better to prepare the ground and to raise up a crop that they would grow as trees of righteousness, that you would water them, that you would care for them, that you would be there in their need when God tells you to be there. Most of us live on the borders of consciousness. We sort of know when God talks to us and we sort of understand when we hear from him. Consciously serving and consciously devoted to God, but all this is immature. It is not the real life of God in us yet. The mature stage is the life of a child which is never conscious about it. We become so abandoned to God that the consciousness of being used never enters in. We just ask and he tells and we do. When we are con consciously being used as broken bread and poured out wine, there's another stage yet to be reached where all consciousness of ourselves and what God is doing through us is eliminated. A saint is never consciously a saint. A saint is consciously dependent upon God for every action, for every thought, for every deed, for every circumstance and for every way with which they open their mouth to share the word, think the thoughts they have to be in the presence of God and to do those things that God tells them to do as he leads them. And they are not themselves led by themselves. So you see, I got spoiled when I was younger to let people sometimes fall down, to let people sometimes hit the ground, to let people sometimes make a mistake. Now, nowadays, God tells me to say things, but still let them go their way. That I might share the word, but not hurt the person. To say, this is what the Bible says, but if God's telling you to do what it is he's telling you to do, then you should do what God tells you to do. And if that works for you, praise the Lord. But if it doesn't, maybe think about this. And so, in that respect, I understand how tempting it is to tell someone what to do rather than suggest a better way. It's always about love. So the bottom line is, when you can and do share the love of God, then God can work through. But when you share anything else other than love, you're playing with fire and you're going to get burned. Because you may not get hurt by the person you're doing it unto, but since you've done it to them, you've done it to Jesus. And the warning, I'm sure, is very well known. And as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, and they are my brethren, I died for them, you've done it unto me. I would be very careful what we tell each other. I'd be more than careful of the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart to make sure that they're pleasing in this sight.